This presentation is called Game Theory. What is it good for? So if we go back to Hamilton's universe and the examples that we use there, they were of this form. We have two individuals. One is blue and one is orange in this example. And blue benefits orange, let's say, and as a result of this, blue is harmed. So we have the benefit flowing from blue to orange. Orange receives the benefit and blue receives the harm. And that is what we call altruism. But what's interesting is that in developing this model, it's based entirely on the actions of one actor. So it's blue's action that makes this altruism. It doesn't depend upon what orange does in return. But what if the outcomes depend not simply on what one actor does, but on what the other actor does as well? And this is the difference that game theory introduces into modeling social behavior. Game theory is all about the outcomes of social interactions when the outcome of what blue does depends upon what orange does and vice versa. So game theory uh, extends back to 1944 when a couple of economists first published a book on this. It's been around then uh, quite some time, but as a leading economist today named Herbert Gintist puts it, and Gintist is the author, among other things, of a book called Game Theory Evolving. So he's what's known as an evolutionary economist who brings together evolutionary theory with economic theory, and the central focus of his work is on game theory. But Gintis stresses that game theory is notationally challenged. You kind of have to go over the game much as you would when you're learning to play a game. Now, the simplest games are two-person games where there's two actors, and we're going to use blue and orange again here. Blue plays the columns of the game, and orange plays the rows. And what I mean by that is that each player has two options. So blue can play either option A or option B, and orange can play also option A or option B. And that means that there's four possible outcomes. And that's because each outcome is the result of the decision of both players. So it's not what just one player does that determines the outcome. It's what both players do. So if both play option A, the outcome is the sum of A plus A, whatever values are attached to those acts. And if orange plays A and blue plays B, the outcome to that is A plus B, according to the values that are attached to those plays. Similarly, if both blue and orange play option B, the outcome of that is B plus B. And then if orange plays option B and blue plays option A, that's going to be B plus A, just the inverse of when orange played A and blue played B. So what we have here are four combinations of plays. And this is more interesting in a way than a situation in which everything is determined by what just one actor does. And you'll note that there's four different outcomes here, and that might get you thinking about, huh, could this be related? Could we connect this somehow to Hamilton's universe? So I'm going to use a card game approach here, and we're going to define a very simple game. The best way to get the handle on a game is to have the rules explained to you and then play a few hands. So we're going to change option A to play and option B to hold. We have the two players, blue playing the columns and orange playing the rows. In this card game, each player has just one card and they only have two choices. They can play the card or they can hold the card. And that gives us the four outcomes a play plus play, hold plus hold, and different players choosing to hold and play. 
So let's put in some scores here because it's not really a game unless there's an outcome. So we're going to say that when orange plays and blue also plays, each player earns two points. So those are shown by the orange two and the blue two. On the other hand, when orange plays and blue holds, orange doesn't get two, orange gets zero points, while blue now gets three points. When they both hold, each player gets just one point. And when orange holds but blue plays, now orange gets the three points and blue gets zero. So I'll look for a bit at this. This is the payoff matrix um, that uh, gives points to blue and orange based on their actions, but not just what they do, but what the other player does. So let's play a hand to illustrate this. And the first hand uh, is where orange plays and blue plays. They both play their card. And as a result of this, based on our payoff matrix, they each get two points. And let's play a second hand. And let's say in this second hand, uh, they both choose to hold the card. And when they do that, uh, they each get one point. So they could also choose that option. But then there's the options where one does one thing and the other does the opposite. So a third combination would be that orange chooses play and blue chooses hold, in which case orange gets zero points and blue gets three, which isn't good for orange. And of course the reverse of that would be when blue plays and orange chooses to hold, in which case orange would get the three points and blue would get zero, which isn't so good for blue, uh, but is the best outcome for orange. So those are the four possibilities, and we work you through this, and we get you used to the rules of the game so that you know what's at stake, and then we put you together to play this game, and you get to play it just one time. In each of those numbers, we multiply that by a 1,000. So three is you can earn $3,000. Zero means you'll earn nothing. Two means that you'll earn $2,000, and one means that you'll earn $1,000. So what are you going to do? Well, if you're the blue player and you know the rules of the game and you look at the possibilities, then here's what might happen. If you play when orange plays, you're going to get $2,000. But if you hold when orange plays, you'll get $3,000. On the other hand, what should you do when orange chooses to hold? Well, if you play when orange holds, you're going to get zero dollars zip. And if you hold when orange holds, so you'll get a thousand dollars. So if we look at this question from the perspective of, of player blue, what should you do when orange chooses play? You should always choose hold. And that's because three thousand dollars is more than two thousand dollars. 3 is greater than 2. And similarly, what should you do when orange chooses hold? Well, you should always choose hold. And that's because $1,000 is more than 0. So whatever orange does, you should choose to hold. And really, the only thing that you should do in this game is hold your cards. And if you do that, you're guaranteed to always get a higher outcome than you would otherwise based on what orange chooses to do. And this is our first deduction from this game. No matter what orange does, blue should always hold. But now let's look at it from the perspective of the orange player. What should the orange player do? And here we have to work vertically. So when blue chooses to play, what should orange do? Well, if orange also plays, orange gets $2,000. But if orange holds, orange gets $3,000. So we're working vertically down this column now, looking at the outcomes of orange's responses to a play by blue. And if we do that, we arrive at the same conclusion that we did with blue, that 3 is greater than 2. And because of that, orange should always choose to hold when blue plays. But what about when blue holds? Well, if orange plays, orange gets zero, but if orange holds, orange gets $1,000. So looking down that column again, one is greater than zero. 
And again, orange should always choose to hold. So this is our second deduction from looking at the possibilities. No matter what blue does, orange should always choose to hold their cards. And if we put these results together, this is what we get. No matter what orange does, blue should always hold. And no matter what blue does, orange should always hold. And this tells us that this game that I've invented here is going to be very boring. It'll be quite predictable. And that's because they only have one shot to play this. They play one hand, and they each know that they're going to come out best if they simply hold their card. So when we look at this, blue should always hold, orange should always hold. That means that hold in this game is what's called the Nash Equilibrium. And what's a Nash Equilibrium? Well, it's the best response that I can make in the game to the best response that you can make to what I do. And remember that this is the best outcome that blue and orange can make to one another. And when they both do that, they both arrive at the choice to hold their cards. Now, if we look at this from another perspective, what's the joint outcome in terms of how much money blue and orange earn from playing the game this way? Well, if they had both chosen to play their hands rather than to hold, they'd each get $2,000, and that adds up to $4,000. If orange had chosen play and blue had chosen hold, blue would have walked away with $3,000, and that would have been the joint earnings. They'd all been in blue's pocket, but it would have been $3,000. And the same thing holds in reverse if orange had held uh, when blue had played. Again, the earnings would be $3,000, but the Nash equilibrium for the players in this game was for both of them to hold. They both got $1,000, and that adds up to a joint earnings of just $2,000. And that means that when each player thinks rationally, they use the numbers to think it through, and they think in terms of their own individual self-interest, the joint outcome is the lowest possible earnings. And that's a dilemma. So what's the dilemma again? The dilemma is that when blue and orange both do what is best for them as individuals, and in this game that's hold their card, the joint outcome, the collective outcome, is the lowest possible earnings. So what's that joint outcome again? $4,000 if they both play, $3,000 if just one of them plays, and $2,000 when they both hold. And what we want to really focus on here is the difference between the earnings in the play play cell and the earnings in the hold whole cell. They could have earned twice as much money if both of them had played their card. But once they rationally think it through and think about what the other player could do, their best decision was to hold the card. But in each of them doing that, they had the lowest joint earnings. And this is the dilemma of this game. So what's best for everyone, earning $4,000, becomes impossible when each individual pursues their own rational self-interest. And this is an example of what's called a collective action dilemma. This is when there's a conflict between what's best for an individual and what's best for everybody. And this puts the lie to the invisible hand argument of Adam Smith, that all that we have to do is follow our own enlightened self-interest and everybody will be better off. One of the reasons why this game that we're looking at became so influential and interesting is because it's clearly not the case when we set up the payoffs in the manner that we have, that doing what's in your individual best interest produces the best outcome for everybody. So the game that we just played is actually what's called the prisoner's dilemma. And the prisoner's dilemma is defined mathematically by a payoff matrix. And you'll see that this matrix is exactly the same matrix that I used in my card game. And what the prisoner's dilemma is, a mathematical model in which the payoffs are structured in this manner. 
Now, generally, when students think about the prisoner's dilemma, they start telling a story about two prisoners who are trying to get the lowest sentence, and they arrive at the conclusion that the prisoner should cooperate, and that's not what the math shows us. So the reason why I didn't tell the story of any prisoners, that, and I don't want you to do that either, I don't want to hear any stories about prisoners, is because when you do that, almost always we arrive at the wrong conclusion. And this is a mathematical model that the story was later attached to. It's not a story that the model was developed to explain. So we want to stick with the numbers and drop the narrative. And to quote Ken Binmore, who's a mathematician and a leading figure in game theory, when we look at the prisoner's dilemma, it represents a situation in which the dice are as loaded against cooperating as they possibly could be. And Binmore has nothing but contempt for social scientists who draw the wrong conclusion from this because they don't do the math. If you're interested, that quote comes from a book called Natural Justice, which applies an evolutionary approach to morality using game theory. And while some have argued that this illustrates a paradox of rationality, Binmore, who's a defender of rational models, argues that there is no such paradox because if you play the prisoner's dilemma game rationally, you don't cooperate. Now there's more, though, than just those that one prisoner's dilemma game. So what we were looking at was a one-shot game where you're going to play the game just one time and you'll never play the game again. And if that's the case, in the one-shot prisoner's dilemma, your choice is not to cooperate. But things change when we go to a repeated game. So repetition changes everything. The repeated game is called the iterated prisoner's dilemma. The one-shot game is called the one-shot pr prisoner's dilemma. And we have introduced the one-shot game. Thank you for listening.